Welcome to Electrified. It's your host, Dylan Loomis. Hope you all had a wonderful and a relaxing Thanksgiving. First up today, I just wanna take a second to lay the base for what's going on right now with Tesla and Graphite and what is set to happen in the months and years to come. I think this is an overlooked aspect of what Tesla has going on for the next 10 years. So again, just want to lay some groundwork or a foundation that we can then build on in the weeks and months ahead. As you can see from this infographic, Graphite is the primary component of all anodes of any type of cathode chemistry. So whether it's nickel cobalt aluminum, nickel manganese cobalt, you get the picture, whatever the cathode chemistry is up top or in the green, the bottom part for the most part remains the same. It's made up mostly of graphite. Now in the future, people are expecting some breakthroughs with silicon doping when it comes to the anode, but for commercial change or production, most people are saying 2025, 2026. So for now, in the next few years, again, mostly the anode is made up of graphite. Here we have data from Benchmark showing us global needle coke supply. Now, if you're not familiar, needle coke is basically what's feeding this graphite production and it comes from two different forms. We have tar pitch, which is from coal, or we have needle coke from oil. So graphite is essentially produced from leftovers or remnants from certain processes from these fossil fuels, coal and oil. The bars on this graph are showing us the supply projections through the next two decades, and the red line are the total demand projections. This divergence that starts right here in 2026, where the red line, the total demand for this global needle coke supply is going to actually exceed the expected supply. The other day, Loop Ventures put out a blog post saying that basically some OEMs are already having troubles sourcing all of the battery raw materials for the batteries over the next, you know, three, four, five years. So those problems will only be exacerbated with each passing year. In case you're like me and you can't move on without knowing why it's called needle coke, well, it's a kind of high quality carbon raw material which is divided into coal and oil series. Its surface shows obvious stripe pattern. When broken, it's mostly long needle shaped fragments. Fibrous structure can be observed under a microscope, so it's called needle coke. So that needle coke feedstock is then used to produce graphite and there are different types of graphite that we should be familiar with. First type is synthetic graphite, which again is used in anode production. This type can be over four times more carbon intensive than the natural counterpart. Currently, most of the world's lithium ion batteries use synthetic graphite, which is especially popular in China. So it would make sense that overall, there's more fragility in the natural graphite supply chain. As we talked about, synthetic graphite is dependent on the fossil fuel industry using these leftovers from crude oil production and coal tar. Then on the other side, we have the natural graphite and the production of this natural graphite is around 55% less carbon intensive than the average synthetic graphite anode. You may hear this one in the future. Spheroidization is the process in which flake graphite particles are mechanically rounded. This yields improvements in the performance of the anode. Right now, there are only 11 companies tracked by benchmark outside of China using this production process. One of them is Syra Resources. But before we get there, listen to this. Nearly 70% of graphite mining in Europe took place in Russia and Ukraine. You may remember earlier this year, Tesla signed a new deal with Syra Resources, which some analysts were saying is a first of a kind deal because this was a move that Tesla was trying to reduce its reliance on the Chinese battery supply chain, working with Australia's Syra. Tesla has plans to buy up to 80% of what this one plant produces starting in 2025. Syra will be sourcing the graphite from Mozambique, but it will then be processing it in Vidalia, Louisiana here in the States. You'll see shortly why this deal is so important and this deal will allow Tesla to source graphite independent from China. Simon Moore said this will reduce some of the questions Tesla is facing about ties to China. One major takeaway many companies had after the pandemic was realizing the length of some of these supply chains globally and the need to shorten them or localize as much of that supply and ultimately production as you can. And I think this right here is a little hidden gem for the United States. Here it is, Syra in Vidalia, Louisiana, the first battery grade natural graphite active anode material supplier in the United States. 
In July of this year, the Department of Energy issued a $102 million loan to Syra Technologies, this facility first of its kind in the country. And it'll be the only vertically integrated large-scale AAM or active anode material manufacturer outside of China. This facility should produce enough anode material to support enough EVs to save 52 million gallons of gas every year. On average, from everything I've read, there's anywhere between 100 and 200 pounds of graphite in every single electric vehicle. Check this out again from Benchmark Mineral Intelligence. The white is 2019 versus 2029 demand expected in the blue. Or you could just read this. Graphite is projected to see the largest increase in demand of all battery minerals over the next decade. Knowing that, right now the vast majority of the world's graphite is sourced in China. In 2021 alone, it mined around 820,000 tons, dwarfing the output of the next nine countries combined. The CEO at Syra Technology said the global anode supply chain is 100% reliant on China at some point within that chain. So just know that while plenty of people argue that Tesla is too reliant on China, the brutal reality is that the entire EV industry is currently way too reliant on China. Earlier, I mentioned silicon doping in the anode. The energy density of modern graphite anodes has virtually been maxed out, so researchers have started infusing these anodes with some silicon, which helps it to hold 10 times the amount of energy. But this comes with a host of its own challenges, of course. It's all about trade-offs in the battery world. This silicon expands and contracts by around 400% as it charges and discharges, which of course adds extra stress to the cell. This graphite supply chain also led to a tariff battle of sorts late last year. Tesla was basically pleading for graphite waivers when it comes to tariffs because it said only mainland China can provide the quantity of graphite it needs in flake or powder form to make its batteries in the US. Tesla also said no company in the United States is currently capable of producing artificial graphite to the required specs and capacity needed for Tesla's production. Plain and simple, over the next five years, we just need this to change. More from Benchmark's COO. Lithium ion batteries are set to become the main driver of flake graphite demand in 2023, and 30 of the world's 45 graphite mines are in China. Benchmark forecasts by 2030, North America will produce only 10% of the world's natural flake graphite, which again is a material that makes up almost all of the anodes for lithium ion batteries. So hopefully that serves as a nice little primer for Tesla and graphite. Main takeaways, the supply chain is heavily reliant on China, but Tesla is ahead of the curve already trying to localize that supply with its deal with Cyber Resources from Vidalia in Louisiana. And second, electric vehicles are set to make up a majority of the graphite demand here over the next few years, and we should see a shortage of this supply sometime around 2026. So again, automakers need to be a few years ahead. Moving on quickly, I just wanna to touch on the FSD beta and deferred revenue as there's been a lot of confusion in the community. First up, who actually has access to Tesla's FSD? Because yes, it went to wide release in North America, but not everybody in North America yet has it. It looks like people on the latest software branch 2022.40 do not yet have it. Right now, it seems like FSD is only on the .36 branch. But Troy Teslake is estimating around 350,000 cars in North America have the beta right now with the wide release, but an additional 1.15 million could get it right now if they bought it or subscribed. So somewhere in the neighborhood of maybe 1.5 million Teslas could in theory have access to FSD beta in North America. The accountant put out a great tweet, I just wanna to touch on one part, where he said, in addition to the $922 million in deferred revenue recognition upside, which works out to 26 cents in earnings per share. In case you wanna know how to actually come to this number on your own, it's simple. All you do is take that $922 million in potential revenue that Tesla could recognize and divide it by the number of shares outstanding, which right now is 3.468 billion. Doing the math, that gives you about 26 cents per share. 
And yes, the question still remains, will Tesla choose to recognize all of that $922 million of deferred revenue in quarter four, or will it be a little bit in Q4 and then a little bit over the next few quarters as well? And yes, it's true, most Wall Street analysts will end up backing this number out because it is just a one-time item, but it's weird because they never really gave Tesla credit for this revenue in the first place, so to some degree, some of these analysts aren't really counting it at all. Now, I would say it's fair for these analysts to back this out because this move does not impact free cash flow at all. It doesn't impact the cash balance. It's really just removing a liability from the balance sheet and adding it to, again, revenue recognition. Now, what these analysts cannot play games with and they can't back out will be the new FSD take rate because again, in theory, Tesla should now be recognizing 100% of all of that revenue coming from the FSD purchase, whether it be upfront or the subscription. That of course will have a positive impact on margins and it won't be a one-time thing, it will be ongoing. So we'll see how Tesla chooses to handle this, but no matter how you try to finagle the numbers, it's a bullish thing overall for Tesla. This one is a rumor for now, but it looks like Tesla has become a part owner in a new semiconductor company in China. All I could really find is the registered capital of this entity is around 150 million US dollars, and the business scope includes semiconductor discrete device manufacturing and integrated circuit chip and product manufacturing. So hopefully we hear more about this in the weeks to come, but right now it looks like Tesla is holding around 5% equity in this company. There was a Tesla recall in China, one for seat belts and one for battery management software, both of which will be fixed with a over the air software update. So VinFast is really doing it. They're officially here in the United States. Around 1,000 of these VF8s have made their way for US delivery over the next few weeks. Canadian and European deliveries are supposed to begin in 2023. Yesterday, while many of us were overindulging, watching football, whatever, Ford snuck this little news item out, saying they had a recall of over 600,000 vehicles, and no, this is not a software update fix. Ford said a cracked fuel injector could cause fuel or fuel vapor to accumulate near hot surfaces, potentially resulting in fire under the hood. Ford said it had 54 total reports of 1.5 liter under hood fires. So this is for ICE vehicles, not EVs, but still. Here we have Hyundai and SK's battery division looking to spend around $1.88 billion on a new joint battery factory here in the States. They'll be looking to start production in the first quarter of 2026, initial capacity around 20 gigawatt hours. It's likely to be located in Georgia. BMW is doubling its investment at a battery plant in Hungary up to $2 billion. BMW saying output for both cars and batteries scheduled to start by the end of 2025. And we still don't have very many details about this vehicle, but the Genesis GV70 is set to come to the United States in 2023. Production is slated to begin in December of this year, but so far this vehicle is only going to be sold in eight states. Here's that list of those initial states. All they really told us is this should be able to charge up to 350 kilowatts, but we don't have any other detail just yet. And to send you guys off on the weekend, just wanted to show you this great chart from James Stevenson showing us the Tesla stock PE compression over the last two or so years. The green line is the quarterly low PE, the red line quarterly high PE. Back in 2020, it was over 300 and fast forward to today and it sits around 56. That'll do it for today. Hope you guys have a wonderful and a safe weekend. Please like the video if you did and a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters.